Hello, I'm Eric Wright, along with Joe Riley of National Drug Screening, and we're here for TREP Talks, as well as getting ready for the Space Coast Business, Business Leaders of the Year 2018. And so So, Joe, I'm excited to be here and talk a little bit about your journey. So, let's kind of start at the beginning. Well, where did you grow up and what were the key influences in your life, you know, that kind of steered you towards business? Sure, Eric, and happy to be here with you. Thank you. And uh, so, I grew up in New York City. Huh? And uh, my upbringing is uh, Irish Catholic mm -hmm. and Catholic grammar school and Catholic high school with the Irish Christian brothers. Uh -huh. and, uh, the Jesuit brothers actually in college. Oh, wow. So uh, besides growing up in New York City and taking the subway to high school. Amazing. Um, the, the, the street <laughs> growing up in Cocoa Beach, I just can't yeah, the, the street smarts were, were quite re remarkable. But uh -huh. Actually, in the summers, we went to Rockaway Beach, which most people don't even realize there's a beach in New York City called Rockaway Beach. No, I, that's the first and, I've uh, heard of it. That was where I actually had my first jobs uh -huh. when I was about 12 years old. Uh -huh. And what would you do? Uh, well, my first job was uh, uh, helping people park their car. I didn't actually park it, but uh -huh. I collected the money yeah, okay. when, when they parked their car at the beach. Uh -huh. And uh, I got 25 cents for every car that I collected the money for the parking for. Uh -huh. Well, that caused you to hustle. Yeah. A little yeah. entrepreneurial I, 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 I used there. to wave the cars in because <laughs> there were three other lots down the street. So oh, okay. I, I had to get mine full first so I can get to the beach. Sure, sure. <laughs> Well, that was great. So, so as you're growing up, you, you went to uh, parochial school. You went to a, a Catholic college, and and what what kind of drew you towards business? I you know, I'm sure that that you more than capable of following a number of different career paths. Well, growing up, you know, uh, my parents struggled. You know, we weren't wealthy or anything, mm -hmm. and um, you know, we ate everything that was on the plate at dinner time. <laughs> And I just wanted to be better for myself and better mm -hmm. for my family. And uh, I always kind of had that entrepreneurial spirit, actually, since I was 12 years old. Yeah. Um, and I went on to, you know, many, many, many jobs. Uh, I, I was never not working in, mm -hmm. in, from the age of 12. And, and I always wanted to own my own business, actually, mm -hmm. ever since I was that age. Yeah, yeah. And so what, what was your, your first major enterprise? Yeah. So I actually graduated from college and went to work um, for the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. ironically. They had an office in New York City, and I was a tax auditor. I had a degree in accounting, and I okay. had a degree in marketing. And um, I hated the job, and I hated my boss. Okay. Um, <laughs> and it's one of those things where, you know, the, the boss was just, just didn't treat us right. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, so I had an opportunity about a year later, a friend of mine said, Let's go down to Florida on vacation. My brother lives down there. We came down to Florida, and my friend's brother had just uh, was thinking about opening up a business with uh, window treatments, mm -hmm. vertical blinds and, and mini blinds that gotcha. were kind of hot in Florida back then yeah. in, the, in the early 80s. Oh, yeah. And he said, why don't you guys come down and help me with this business? Mm -hmm. And so we went back to New York, and we loaded up our cars, and we moved to Florida. Oh, wow. Now, you were a single guy at this time. I was a single guy. Okay. It was easy to move. It was <laughs> easy to relocate. Everything went in the car. And uh, we could rub two nickels together, and, and we, could, we could find all-you-can-eat buffets. And, <laughs> you, know, you know, we struggled, but we got yeah. it done. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you came down for that particular uh, enterprise. How, how did that turn out? It turned out well. There were three partners, myself and, and, and two brothers, and we had a business in Coral Springs, Florida, mm -hmm. and then we actually moved it to Palm Bay, okay. and, and that's how we found Brevard County. I see. Because uh, Palm Bay was such a growing area, mm -hmm. back then general development had built out all the streets and the houses were going up, and right. our marketing strategy was really to follow moving trucks home. <laughs> <laughs> because we would follow the moving truck and there'd uh -huh. be no blinds on the windows. We would knock on the door and say, right. hey, we could put blinds up and have, have them back to you in five days. Oh, wow. And, wow. and so we, we did really well, but as, as time went on, three owners in one business, uh -huh. um, it was time for one of us to move on, and I, and I took that step. And yeah. uh, a friend of mine had opened a, uh, a restaurant, nightclub, bar type of uh business in Palm Bay and, and he was actually struggling with it. He knew nothing about that business. And, mm -hmm. uh, I had kind of worked my way through college 
in the bars and the nightclubs and the right. restaurants, and I ended up taking over that bar and restaurant for him. And oh, wow. I did that for nine years. Okay, okay. So, so between that restaurant experience and launching this business, were, were there any other in enterprises in there? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, getting out of the restaurant and bar business, which is, is, is a young man's game. Yes. A, a lot of hard work, and it was time for me to move out of that, okay? <laughs> But get actually, some sleep, huh? <laughs> I actually did something similar. I went in, I had a partner, and we got together, and um, we did loss prevention programs for the hospitality industry. Hmm. Bars, nightclubs, restaurants, country clubs. Anybody that sold alcoholic beverages in Florida, uh -huh. we put together a, um, a proactive training program and a proactive management program to avoid risk of losing their liquor license. Ah. And uh, we, we actually had clients from Key West all the way to Pensacola. Huh. When, when you said that, I was thinking, uh, you know, how do you, how do you monitor your employees at the till and all that kind of stuff? But that makes perfect sense, you know, that you've got all kinds of liabilities for underage drinking and all that kind of stuff. So that was sort of your first foray into the whole education yeah, and, and space. Yeah, and there's a little bit of, of the drug scene in that, too, because right. if you owned a restaurant or a bar, anyone that had a liquor license, and there was drug activity on your premises, you could actually lose your liquor license. I see. And that puts you out of business. Yeah, right. That's that's an expensive hit. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. So so how long did you did you chase that? So we, we did that business for about five or six years and probably in about our fourth or fifth year, uh, we came across a new law in Florida that said if you implement a comprehensive drug free workplace program in your business, mm -hmm you would automatically, by statute, qualify for a 5% reduction on your workers' comp insurance. Oh, wow. Big and so incentive. We saw that how, as how an you, incentive. How did you find out about that? I mean, was it just you know, anecdotal? Work, or? Well, it was kind of workers' comp rates were really high. Uh -huh. uh, we had a lot of clients that were complaining about that, not, not that we had anything to do with it, but, yeah, sure. but we always looked at, you know, what are our clients, you know, what are, they, what are their needs, and we saw this issue of, of high workers' comp, and I don't know whether I read it in the paper or mm -hmm. whatever it might be, but we came across that um, statute. And we also had a friend of ours who had kind of relocated out of Florida and, and had just come back, and we said, his name was Dennis. We said, hey, Dennis, where you been? Well, I've been working uh, for this company called LabCorp up in New Hampshire and doing mm -hmm. drug testing. And, man, that's really a booming business. Mm -hmm. And so the lights started Sure. Click in here. Yeah. We got this workers' comp discount incentive mm -hmm. for a business to implement a drug free workplace program. And then we got this other message that there's there's business activity, even in right. other states, right. which when we opened we, we were focusing on Florida. Mm -hmm. We didn't didn't even realize it was gonna be a national business. Huh. You know, it's it's interesting, Joe. I met a lot of guys that had accounting majors and then a lot of guys that had marketing majors. Yeah. I haven't met too many that, <laughs> that play in both pools, you know. Well, it, it's, it's a quick, interesting story. I started out in biology in college, okay. quickly found out that that was way too hard. <laughs> so I was a little bit behind on, on the accounting courses. Uh -huh. So um, I wanted to graduate with, with my graduating class, so I mm -hmm. took a couple extra marketing classes to graduate, and then that summer I finished up my last accounting course. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's, that's how I ended up with the two majors. Well, and another thing interesting about what you've told me thus far is in, in most of your businesses, you had partnerships, and partnerships can often be a risky scheme, but you seem to have navigated that pretty successfully. Uh, just about every partnership it'd be eventually, you know, has a has a rise and a, you know, a, a, an exit. Yeah. What what were the keys so, to making that work? Well well certainly at a young age a partnership makes it a lot easier. I mean yeah. I didn't have a lot of capital to sure. go, go into businesses. Um, our first business was a lot of sweat. Uh -huh. you know, it was three guys that did everything. I mean yeah. we sold the blinds, we installed the blinds. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, not all partnerships are all that great, and, and there, there's pros and cons to everything. And mm -hmm. so, you know, in the different businesses that I've had, I've had partners, I haven't had partners. Mm -hmm. um, I guess as you evolve and you become a more savvy business person, you, you can do it without partnership. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're going into, you know, some 
big development venture or something like that. Mm -hmm. You probably need partnerships for capital. Sure. But as I've evolved in business, I've gotten to the point where I haven't needed that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you launch into this new enterprise. You're, you're familiar with it. You're, you're seeing the signs that this could be very lucrative. How did you capitalize that? I mean, that, that yeah. I, I'm sure that there was some capital. So, so again, it was uh, when we started, I had a partner and mm -hmm. we had an ongoing business that was, okay. that was doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. So we started out as Florida drug screening. As okay. a business, actually, our office was in Palm Bay, uh -huh. our first office, and you know we had about twenty employees, and so we kind of moved a couple of people of those twenty to help us run gotcha. this drug testing side. Uh -huh. So we, we we had some opportunity there with the existing office infrastructure uh -huh. and with the with the existing you just uh, leveraged it over with it. existing staff. Uh -huh. And at, uh, a couple of years later, my partner wanted to move one side of the business to Tallahassee, Florida to be closer to the state capital because we were, uh -huh. that business was, was becoming a little bit of uh, political. The Florida Restaurant Association was located in, in mm -hmm. Tallahassee and there was a close relationship and I didn't really want to move okay. uh, out of Brevard <laughs> County. Yeah. And so we made a deal that I would keep the drug screening company and he would keep the other company. Mm -hmm. And we still worked together for many years back and forth as consultants with both businesses. Right. Huh. But well, that's how well, I kind of got into it on my own. Huh. Now, uh, I would assume, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Joe, but you kind of ground floor with this, you know, growing awareness, industry, opportunity. How, how, is it, how has it changed? How has it evolved during, during your time here? And first yes. of all, tell us, from, from the time you launch Florida drug screening to today, well, you know, what kind of period are we talking about there? No, oh, this is my 25th year in the industry. 25th year, okay. Yeah, so so, yeah, so, it's, it's, so uh, you, you have definitely percent. seen where, where things have moved, and, and how yeah. would you describe that? You know, so in the early days, drug testing really didn't get started, workplace drug testing in the United States until about the late 80s. Mm -hmm. It was under uh, President Ronald Reagan uh -huh. who first implemented uh, rules that would require federal employees to be drug tested. Okay. Now that stemmed out of the Army and the Navy. They actually started drug testing prior mm -hmm. to that. So when I got into it in 93, the, the industry is only about five years old. Okay. That, okay. That's sort of what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. And so, and, and we didn't even see the big scope of it. I didn't see the big scope of it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at the Florida market and businesses with high workers' comp rates mm -hmm. so we could save them some money. Uh, for instance, this would be like trucking companies, well, machinery I, companies. Am I correct? Initially, it was manufacturers and construction companies and mm -hmm. uh people that climbed up trees, any kind of business with a high workers' comp rate. Right. But then came the truck drivers. Okay. Because... <laughs> Sounds they, like that was a sort of a quantum well, shift. Well, then, then we kind of realized that the United States Department of Transportation requires drug testing uh, of transportation-related industries. Okay. The trucking industry, the motor coast industry, the airline industry, right. the, the uh, traveling boat public industry, mm -hmm. railroads, subways. Mm -hmm. Uh, oil and gas pipelines, hmm. all required drug Any testing. Any interstate sort of By the traffic. federal government, yeah, okay. based on the size of the truck, 26,001 mm -hmm. pounds or more, huh. or based on the size of the bus, over 16 passengers. Okay. All required, there's over 8 million transportation-related employees in this country. Hmm. So now the market's becoming much bigger, and now the internet comes along. Mm -hmm. and that was a game changer. Okay. Okay. And so... Now it became, wow, we could do business everywhere. We can put up a website and have a national brochure. Mm -hmm. And and we were actually, you know, I was very fortunate to be one of the first, you know, drug testing companies, actually one of the first in the nation to put up a, a website for drug testing. Okay. And to actually market to uh -huh. businesses and individuals our, well, our, our services through the internet. Well, now let me pause you there. Uh, you know, a lot of people are were late adopters on on recognizing the potential of the internet and, and all that kind of stuff. But you, it, it specifically in your industry, especially, were a very early adopter. Yeah. What? Why? What? What was it that yeah. that made you realize that this is where the future of commerce was going? Well, from a young age, not that young, but in college. I, I saw computers and I, and I was kind of interested. Mm -hmm. 
um, and I had an uncle, Uncle Charlie, mm -hmm. and he, he worked for, he was a systems analyst, and he okay. knew everything about computers, and mm -hmm. he worked for IBM and a bunch of mm -hmm. other big companies, and I had to do this project in a computer course in college, mm -hmm. uh, me and, a, and another guy, it was a team project, and Uncle Charlie helped us with this project. <laughs> we, we put together this payroll program on a DOS system, and yeah. the, Printed out, you know, payroll for Ricky Ricardo and Lucille Ball, and made, made up a bunch of names. And so I always liked computers. And when, like, when AOL came out, I got my AOL email. You got yeah. mail, and uh -huh. did, and you know, in in our in our risk management business, we had a DOS program that somebody mm -hmm. had written for us. And mm -hmm. then when you know Microsoft Office and that stuff started coming out, and like this stuff is really cool. Yeah, right. You know. So, so it was very natural then. You were already, you know, moving into exactly. being a technologist. And, and, and I'll tell you another thing that was an influencer. I took a typing course in high school. Mm -hmm. It's probably the best thing I've ever done because I can actually type. <laughs> well, you know, I <laughs> paid in the typing course, but I, I still use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, fascinating, fascinating. So. Um, you were talking about how the business has scaled, and, and you, you mentioned how you were early adopter on, on using the internet to market your services, but, but how has it expanded, and, and how have you been able to catch that wave? Yeah, so one of the biggest ways that I caught the wave is getting involved in the industry and becoming as knowledgeable as possible about everything that goes on within workplace drug testing in the United States, and that hmm. includes DOT regulations, that includes federal guidelines for workplace drug testing. That includes different state laws that have evolved over the last 25 years mm -hmm. for drug testing. And I got involved with our National Drug and Alcohol Testing Association, uh, which is a national trade organization. Right. And I got really involved. I got on the board of directors. And a couple of years later, I got elected to serve on the executive committee. Mm -hmm. And another year later, I got elected to be the chairman of the board. Uh -huh. And so I served as the national chairman of the board of the Drug and Alcohol Testing Industry Association mm -hmm. for four years. And collectively on that board of directors over the course of the last 25 years for about 12 of those years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that led me to meet you know, people all over the United States regulators, business people, industry officials, and I really immersed myself and I said, I'm going to become as knowledgeable as possible mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to sponge up every bit of information yeah. that I can. And that and aggressive networking and aggressive use of technology and the internet and, and really building my business with a, a philosophy of, you know, being ethical, mm -hmm. you know, Charging money for our services, but charging a fair price. We've got to make we've got to make a profit, right. but it's got to be fair, mm -hmm. and we do it right. And mm -hmm. if we make a mistake, we own up to it right. because we can always make mistakes. Sure. And you know, the last thing you want to do is make a mistake and not tell the client. Sure. Oh yeah. Uh, Especially they, your and business. They, and then they find out about it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, right. Right. So we built the business on those type of things, on networking and knowledge and mm -hmm. on ethics and, and and charging a fair price. You know, this is this is all incredible advice for the young entrepreneur that may may view this but uh, this 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 idea of of proactively participating in your your industry associations and everything that that seemed like a a great opportunity probably not only to network but maybe some industry mentors for you i don't know did did it happen that way and i'm sure you served as a mentor for others yeah i i found some mentors in, in the drug and alcohol testing business. Mm -hmm. um, there's a gentleman by the name of Bill Current out of mm -hmm. South Florida who's been in the industry about 30 years, uh -huh. written a few publications. And early on, I, I heard him speak at a conference and, and really looked up to him. Uh -huh. But you know, all that you know involvement, it really kind of started really young in my business career because I wanted to be active. I was active in the Palm Bay Chamber of Commerce. I right. served on their board of directors. Mm -hmm. I was active in the Melbourne Chamber of Commerce. I've mm -hmm. served on their board of directors. Right. I'm a past president of the Palm Bay Rotary Club, uh -huh. um, member of the South Brevard Human Resources Association. Mm -hmm. So local involvement and then national involvement. But mm -hmm. you mentioned young people coming into the business. Mm -hmm. There's also middle-aged people coming into business. Well, sure. There's that's, also that's a very retired good people coming into this business. Right. And, 
Uh, I get calls and, and people ask me to help them, and I'm willing to help people get into business. Yeah. Uh, and I've served as a mentor to a lot of people getting into this business. And some make it and some don't. Well, let's, let's talk about that for a second, yeah. because not only do you have your business, let's just say business proper with your clients that you serve with drug testing services, you also help launch people in the business um, and you provide some resources that help them succeed. So tell us about that and how you got into that, Joe. Yeah, so um, I kind of get into that because, you know, again, with aggressive use of technology, and we saw that a lot of other people in the drug and alcohol testing industry were not using technology. And we said, okay, new people getting into business were calling me up because they recognized me or heard about me and, mm -hmm. you know, become known as a national expert right. in workplace drug testing and said, so I said, well, these people are going to call me, I'll, I'll help them. And uh, we started what we called a reseller program. Mm -hmm. So so basically, we, we took our back office operation that, that we used to serve our clients, mm -hmm. and we offered that back office operation to help somebody else serve their clients so that they could cut down on the capital investment and on sure, the labor sure. and the technology end, and they can go out and they can sell and provide good customer service on the front end. Okay, and and usually the the backside is is where you have so much overhead cost and everything like that. Yeah, so. and, and a lot of the overhead is in knowledge. <laughs> yeah, that's okay? true. Okay, and it takes a it takes a lot of time. You know, people call. I want to get in the drug testing business. You think mm -hmm. I can get started in a couple of weeks? Uh -huh. No. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, sure. you really got to learn. You, uh -huh. and, and, you know, we provide a lot of that learning, but, you know, the people that aren't willing to do their homework, mm -hmm. and I give them reading materials, I give them videos, I give them webinars, uh -huh. I, I go meet with them one-on-one -on -one where they're located in mm -hmm. their business community right. for a couple of days. But if they're not doing their homework and they're not learning every single day and they're not right. getting involved in their community, they're not going to make it. Right, right. right. You know? Huh. Well... If, if they're not operating their business, obviously, like you have, um, you've been obviously successful, Joe, and I know that in a large part that's because you have cultivated uh, an environment in your workplace. You, you work with workplace development, so I'm sure that, that you're a student of that because you're a student of business, I can tell. Um, and, and what are the things that you have tried to institute, you know, on the inside of your company that you think has produced, you know, loyalty, longevity, all, all those requirements that we have for human resources today? Yeah, it's a great question, Eric. So, you know, in, in my schooling, I learned respect and I, and I learned loyalty and I mm -hmm. learned hard work. Yeah. And uh, when I, my first job out of college in a professional, I, I didn't really like the boss and it's almost kind of like, I want to treat people the way I would like to be treated. Yeah. Okay. And I want to give my employees, which, which we strive to do, the opportunity to learn and advance themselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that we do here at National Drug Screening is every Tuesday at 7.15 in the morning, we have an all-hands-on-deck meeting mm -hmm. for an hour and a half so that we're all on the same page, we're learning together, and we're learning new stuff. Mm -hmm. And I give my employees an opportunity to go to industry conferences mm -hmm. uh, and to take webinars and other learning opportunities because I want them to excel. Yeah. Because I can't do it all myself, and I'm I don't sure. want to do it all myself. Sure. And I do want to take time from now and again to enjoy my family. Oh, right. And of so I want to give the people that work with us an opportunity to excel and to move forward and to make themselves better. Mm -hmm for their families and, and for them. Now, that, that works with a lot of people, right? but sometimes you get the ones that it doesn't work with. Right. And, you know, and you got the A players and the B players and the mm -hmm. C players, and at times the C players gotta go. Right. You know, Joe, you um, just alluded to something. Uh, neither one of us are, are in our 20s anymore, and as you grow in your business, uh, there's the old cliche that you want to work more and more on your business and less in your business. Exactly. And, and so how, how has that evolved for you as a business leader? And, and what are the steps that you've taken to ensure that that's happening? Yeah, so it's really important. And sometimes it's quite difficult. Mm -hmm. okay? yep. But, you know, some of the things that I've done is, you know, hiring some good people, mm -hmm. 
paying paying good salaries, hiring professional people, mm -hmm. um, and letting go a lot of, huh. of the things that I have to do. And, yeah. and you've got to, you know, you've got to offer benefits, which we do. You've mm -hmm. got to offer uh, a nice place to work, which mm -hmm. we do. And for your top people, you, you've got to pay good salaries. Right. And so I don't, I don't have a problem with that. Uh -huh. um, because I need good people to do what we do. We, Absolutely. We, 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 you know, we generate a lot of business out of our offices uh -huh. uh, nationwide, all over the United States. We've mm -hmm. got over a thousand customers, mm -hmm. and collectively with our resellers, we've got over five thousand customers. Wow! Wow! So it takes a team of people. It doesn't take me or I. <laughs> yeah. It takes a team. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, Joe, you've got a long history, not only in this business, but in previous businesses that you've started and scaled and, and moved on from. Uh, what, were the, what were the biggest challenges for you? I mean, you, you had to have a few moments where you said, you know, I think I'd rather go, you know, work for this accounting firm or whatever. Well, I don't know if I had that. Challenges. And one of the ones, what we just talked about is finding good people. Yeah. And, and it's difficult. It's, sure. it's not an easy task. Um, so that, that that's always been a challenge. Um, to be honest with you, I've been a very fortunate in, in a number of ways in, mm -hmm. in the businesses that I've had, particularly for the last 25 years in, mm -hmm. in drug and alcohol testing. Um, you know, I really focus myself as this is a business that I'm going to learn and I'm going to know inside and out. Mm -hmm. So so that's helped me. But, um, you know, as, as far as challenges go, and, and, you know, it's unfortunate that this business isn't going away. <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I just read the latest statistic in, in 2016, there were 28 million Americans that had admitted to illicit drug use mm. in 2016, 28 million. Well, 2017 numbers just came out from the federal government. They, they do an anonymous, not anonymous, they do a, a voluntary study. People right. admit to using yeah. drugs. It went from 28 million to 30 million. Wow. It went from... You know, 9.9% .9 of the population to 10.9% of the population. Joe, as a nationwide sort of industry subject matter expert, how has how has the changing legal status of marijuana, both recreational and medical, impacted the industry? How is the industry responding to that? Yeah, it's a great question, it's, and it's definitely marijuana is the hottest topic in our industry, mm -hmm. medical, recreational, illegal under federal law. Will that change? Will it mm -hmm. not change? Um, the biggest issue that I see for employers is that leadership at every company has mm -hmm. got to sit down and talk about it. Mm -hmm. and, and it has to be relevant to where they are mm -hmm. and where they do business. Right. They might be in a state that hasn't yet passed medical marijuana. Okay. They might be in a state that has medical marijuana mm -hmm. and maybe one of the eight states that has recreational marijuana. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these drug-free workplace policies that companies have were written 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There were no questions back then. Marijuana mm -hmm. was illegal mm -hmm. and smoking marijuana was a prohibited condition of employment. Okay, right. And it still is in many workplaces. Mm -hmm. United States Department of Transportation, they don't care what state you're in. Mm -hmm. If you drive a truck for a living, you cannot smoke pot. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't matter where you live. Okay. <laughs> but in a non regulated environment, a company mm -hmm. that's not regulated by the federal government, mm -hmm. they've got to make some decisions. Mm -hmm. They've got to filter those decisions down into a policy. Mm -hmm. They've got to educate and train their HR professionals and their safety professionals what is the policy. And they've got to educate their employees. I see. What's allowed, what's not allowed, and what are the consequences? You know, is there going to be some type of accommodation if somebody has a medical marijuana card? I see. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, it, for recreational marijuana, you know, you can't smoke pot where you're working. Yes. Every law that's been written has said that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, how do you know if they're not smoking it on the way to work? Sure. And, and that's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in our business, mm -hmm. you know, this marijuana stuff is, has been on a roller coaster for a good five years. Uh -huh. We've seen nothing but an increase in business right. in the last five years. So, you know, I'm, I'm walking away with really sort of two takeaways. Number one, if you're a company, you really need to vet your attitude, 
you need to turn that into a policy. Uh, you need to have HR and legal run that through the sieve so that well you're said. on strong footing Very well you know, said. before yep. you implement anything. And the other thing I'm coming away with is you know, this is this is an ongoing story. We, we don't know where oh, yeah. this is going to end yeah, up. This is of, not like you know, prohibition ends, so, so boom. Something happens at the federal level, then there's all types of changes that, and, and deci more decisions that have to be made, more policies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, another big issue is training supervisors to recognize signs and symptoms that someone mm -hmm. might be under the influence while at work. Right. Because that now becomes a safety situation. Uh -huh. And now that becomes a situation where someone could get hurt. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the person that's yeah. so, high, so both the individual else. has liability, but the business has liability to identify that risk factor and deal with it. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. And so what, what we've done in our business and, and what I've done is, is uh, you know, growing into becoming a national expert and learning and all the time is now I help companies with their policies. Mm -hmm. I help companies with the training of their supervisors mm -hmm. for reasonable suspicion, signs, and symptoms. Mm -hmm. Joe, if you were to um, have the opportunity to uh, go back 30 years ago and advise the younger version of you, <laughs> what what, what advice would you give yourself? Well, and I think it's probably true for any business is knowledge and education. Mm -hmm. Knowledge and education. You've, you've got to, you know, the difference in sales between somebody who knows their product and service and somebody who doesn't know their product and service mm -hmm. is really apparent. Right. Okay. And, you know, if you're able to answer the hard questions mm -hmm. and you're able to, you know, portray that, this guy is an expert. He mm -hmm. does know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get through to a young person, even yeah. a guy that's retired and but wants to start a second business. Uh -huh. it, it's hard to get through that. You, you really got to sit down and learn this stuff, mm -hmm. okay? And, you know, you know, if I was going to go sell cars, well, may, maybe I've known cars my whole life because mm -hmm. I, I like cars and I've sure. played with cars and I fix cars and uh -huh. I, I follow cars, but... Not a lot of people know about drug testing, you know. <laughs> right. you know so knowledge is uh, is key. Uh, and, you know, involvement in the community is always key. I've always believed that. I've mm -hmm. always been involved. I encourage my employees mm -hmm. to be involved. We have we have several member key members of our management team mm -hmm. that are involved in, in in local community organizations, business organizations, and national organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, and and you gotta you, you gotta work hard. You, you gotta work smart, but you gotta work hard too. Yeah. You gotta put your nose to the ground. And as you know, anybody that's owned their own business mm -hmm. knows. And if they don't know it, I don't know if they really own their own business. You work harder than in any of your employees. Yeah. Sure. Sure. One last question: How how has your faith informed your business philosophy? You know you. you you know, described how you grew up, the colleges that you went to. And, sure, sure. And I, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I think it's um, my faith has, has, you know, molded my way of doing things to doing it right, mm -hmm. treating people fairly, mm -hmm. and, you know, thanking the Lord for what he's given me. Sure. Okay. And um, that's what how I was brought up, and that's what I was taught in school, and I was taught respect, yeah, and I was taught loyalty, and you know, faith in God, mm -hmm. and do it right and treat people right. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Well, thanks so much for uh, an incredible, you know, recap of your journey. And quite frankly, I could go on and on. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 could, I could probably talk to you for <laughs> four or five more uh, hours. And, uh, really, really good questions. I enjoyed. Uh, uh, the way you shaped them and, and uh -huh. led, led me through the journey. Well, good. Reminded good. me of, of the journey. You well, know, I've been 25 years, which is <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it flew like that, too. Oh, oh yeah. Well, <laughs> isn't that the case yeah. for all of us? Well, well super. All right. Well, Thank good. you. Okay. I appreciate it.